The Wood Whisperer is sponsored by Powermatic, the gold standard since 1921. And by Rockler Woodworking and Hardware. Create with confidence. All right, so now it's time to start the assembly. And in honor of Norm retiring recently, we're going to start some assembly. And if you get that joke, you're a big wood nerd. Now I'm going to start very slowly. I'm not going to rush this one. Um, you know, in this case, like I said, with the type of uh, tongue and groove joints that we have going here, it's not quite self-squaring, but it's hard to really get it out of square. So I feel confident doing basically one piece at a time, making sure it's all lined up, square it up, apply a little bit of clamping pressure. As long as it's fully seated, you don't need a whole lot of clamping pressure. Uh, start with the left side, and then I'll work my way to the back panel, and then I'll put in the other side, and then the center partition, and then we'll put the top on. Now I'm just going to feel with my fingers back here to make sure that these grooves are in perfect alignment. So now I'm just going to apply a little bit of clamping pressure and this whole time that I'm doing this I'm going to keep a square in place because I want to make sure I don't knock it one way or the other and I don't need much clamping pressure here so that's pretty much good enough. Now the key to a good glue up in my opinion is reducing the number of variables and the number of things that can go wrong. So gluing one piece up at a time like this making sure it's perfectly square before I move on to the next thing is really a way for me to ensure that I just don't make any mistakes and it really makes for a stress-free glue up. So I'm going to follow that pattern through this whole thing. Realize though sometimes on some projects you have no choice. You have to glue all the parts up in one shot or you might be in a situation where you need to hurry. So that's when you look into other things like slow setting glues and stuff uh, that will make your life a lot easier. But for me this works. I'm in no major rush. I don't want it to take all week but uh, it doesn't necessarily need to be all done tonight. All right, well, it's getting late in the day. I think I'm just going to let this one panel dry overnight. And tomorrow I'll come in. I'll be able to put the back panel in, follow it up with the, uh, with the side panel, and then the center partition. And we'll be moving right along. But for now, I need some dinner. All right, now it's time for the back panel. Now, I know from experience with putting this thing together in a dry assembly that the back panel actually presents uh, some difficulty for me in getting it installed perfectly. I want to get the groove on the back panel lined up with my groove right here in the middle. I want to make sure it's fully seated up against this groove on the side and fully seated down on the bottom. So to make sure this all goes pretty smooth, what I'm going to do is switch over to epoxy instead of yellow glue. So I'm using this West System epoxy and these pumps and that'll give me some more working time. Just give it a good mix and just apply it like any other glue. Here we go. Well, that slid in a lot better with the epoxy than it did in the dry assembly, so the epoxy is more or less acting uh, almost like lubrication. Whereas a, uh, a water-based glue gets into the fibers and absorbs into the fibers and causes them to swell, and that's what makes the joint fit tighter after you apply glue to it than it did in the dry assembly. So I'm very, very happy with my, my call to use epoxy on this one. Now again, I'm checking this center groove here to make sure that I'm in alignment. And actually, that looks perfect. And now a couple of clamps just to apply some downward pressure. All right, it's early. So I'm going to get some coffee. Now the back panel is pretty well set up at this point, so I'm going to put in the center partition. And this is going to be fairly fast, so all I really need is yellow glue. Okay, plenty of glue there now. I could insert it. All right, it's going to need a little bit of help here.
looks good. Now I'm going to glue in the final side panel. Yellow glue on this one too. And this one should just pop right in place. I'm going to try another one of these bow clamps here on the side to help distribute the clamping pressure. Oh yeah, that worked very nicely. Just one more clamp at the front and I think we're in business. This is an interesting thing to notice now. In the back of the case, it's dead on. If everything was cut square and that first piece was aligned square and you don't really tweak it out of position, everything should be square from here on out. But it's always good to double check. When I check at the back, it's dead on. At the front, it widens out a little bit here, which means that this clamp is causing the left side to tilt over to the left a little bit. So I'm just gonna adjust my clamping pressure to kind of bring it back that way. There we go. No big deal. It might not even affect anything because it's all the way out here, but it's, it's nice to have it perfectly square while the glue is drying. Now it's do or die time. Time to put the uh, top on. So I've got some epoxy here again. I need that little extra bit of working time. And I'm just gonna put it on the tongues and into the, the dados and grooves and hope it all goes together. Okay, let's see if we can make this happen without crying. It's a little clamping pressure. We'll drive those joints home. We are well on our way. So just gonna add one more clamp here in the front, just to add a little bit of pressure on that front center partition. Let's see just a little hairline gap and I wanna close that up. Basically, I'm just gonna let this dry for the rest of the day and in the meantime, I can start uh, taking the measurements and making the final plans for the two doors. So now, we're gonna focus on the doors. Now, I've been through a couple different versions of what I wanted to do with the doors. If you remember, initially, I was gonna do sliding doors after talking to, uh, to Boas and seeing the doors on his tool chest, it kind of gave me the thought that I really think that's the best way to go for the most people uh, because everybody could really use this extra storage space. Now, what I have here is a little mock-up of the door. Um, what we're gonna have is over an inch, maybe about an inch and a quarter inside depth that somebody can hang things on the inside of the door. The outside of the door is just gonna be a very simple half-inch panel with a little bit of a reveal all the way around. So this Baltic birch, that striping pattern, will carry all the way around. And it should look pretty interesting. There's gonna be a bevel here on the inside and a bevel on the outside. If you look at the inside of the door, I've got a little bevel here as well. So again, no areas for you to uh, get a splinter or anything like that. Now, interestingly enough, uh, I know I said I was gonna do everything out of the Baltic birch, but Number one, I wanted to lighten up the doors a little bit. I don't want them to be excessively heavy. And the most I'm really gonna do with the doors, well, you'll see later when we start adding in some of the cool stuff to the cabinet, but you could still, with half inch ply, you could still put a dowel in there easily and get enough support to hang uh, the light tools that you would be hanging in the door anyway. But adding that three quarter inch panel, in addition to all this stuff you're gonna hang in there, just seemed like it was a little excessive. So I wanted the half inch. Now the real reason I went with the half inch was because I didn't plan properly. And uh, the leftover material that I had that I was gonna use to make the door, um, well, one panel had the grain going in the right direction and the other panel had the grain going horizontally, which is not what I wanted. Um, so it was either have one up and one sideways or go buy some material. <laughs> so I just went out to Home Depot and I bought one of those pre-cut uh, two by four uh, panels that they have. And this stuff was nice and straight. I eyeballed it. It's not the best plywood in the world, but certainly good enough for these doors. So that's what we're gonna use. So two versions of, of uh, the story there. I'm gonna stick to the first one. Now I'm not gonna go too deep into the construction of the door because it's pretty much exactly the same stuff that we did to make the case. I used the dado stack to create the groove all the way through the pieces 
The only difference here is we don't have to do any prep work to this panel. I basically used my dado stack to get the exact thickness for this piece of material and there was no problem with that. If you don't want to use the dado stack, you could certainly use your router to make this and just make sure you use one of those undersized bits. This panel happens to be correctly undersized for the types of bits that they sell in the market. So I made all these grooves and one thing I do want to bring your attention to here is when you make a groove all the way through these boards, there's going to be a point where these two boards meet. And if you have that groove going all the way through, depending on how you join these two pieces, that groove may be visible from the top and bottom of the door. You know, it's kind of like when you uh, are putting a drawer together and you put the groove for the panel. It's the same concept. You don't want that peeking out the front. So you have to come up with a way to disguise it. And what I decided to do was make a little nub, little guy tenon here. I mean, it's not very substantial at all. It doesn't really need to be. But that is going to go into that groove so that from the top view and the bottom view, it doesn't look too bad. There's no big gaps here that we have to contend with. Now for fine furniture, I don't, this wouldn't exactly do, but the key is we're turning our frame pieces for the doors up on their side. Normally, frame pieces for doors would be oriented in this way. And then you could put you know, some more substantial joinery or some sort of a tenon or a haunch tenon. Uh, we can't really do that here because the pieces are, are fitting together this way. You know? So it's a little bit more of a challenge there, but I think this works really well. It's nice and uh, supported. The panel is cut to fit perfectly, so with enough glue around the outside, I think it's gonna be a, a decent joint. I have really no concerns about strength. So I'm gonna start cutting the rest of the pieces and then it's just a matter of gluing them together. Now the only thing I do wanna bring your attention to that was a little bit different than what we've done in the past, when I cut these little tenons on the end, I actually had to raise the dado blade up pretty high to make this cut here. But what I would just recommend doing is using your miter gauge, using your fence as a guide, and then put a backer board, and that's what I have here, is a backer board supporting the fibers so you get a nice clean cut on the exit side. So I have the epoxy mixture again. I need that little extra working time, and I'm just gonna add some glue to the groove here. And in these deep grooves, it's really important that you get the side walls. And it's hard to do this and not be messy, so let's do the best you can. Now on the pieces with the little tenon, you wanna make sure you get a good amount of glue here on the end grain and on the tenon itself on all sides. So in order to prevent having to put any glue on the panel itself, which in this case, since there's no tongue here, it's gonna be kind of tricky to know how far to put the glue in. I was just extra generous about how much glue I put into the grooves themselves. And it should be enough to distribute the glue onto the workpiece. top piece. So I'm going to place it in the clamps and you'll notice that I've got the clamps laying down flat instead of upright. The reason for that is with this type of setup, if I have the clamp going vertical like this, a lot of times what's going to happen is it's going to push the top of this piece forward a little bit more than I want. I really just want the pressure to be focused down on where that joint is. And then the top will just line up in place where it's supposed to. In theory, of course. So I'm apply a little pressure. I wanna make sure I'm nice and flush at the bottom, which I'm not. How's that view of my back? Okay, that's nice and flush. A little tappy tap. That's nice and flush. And now I'm gonna run a couple clamps across this way. And I don't really need a lot of clamping pressure here because the joints can only go in so far. Once a dado is seated, it's seated and that's it. I'm just trying to close up any little gaps that I see and make sure everything is nice and tight. Now before we attach the doors, I want to play with the layout of the tools and it's just going to be much easier without the doors installed. So I have the whole cabinet laying flat on the table and I'm just going to play on the inside, move some things around and show you exactly how I'm going to stabilize these uh, hand planes and the rest of the tools in here. And really this is where your creativity is the only limitation. 
There's a lot of different things that you could put in here and you've just got to come up with ways of securing them. So I'll show you what I'm going to do for mine and I would love to hear the suggestions that you guys come up with. So what we've got here is a nice uh, overhead view of the right compartment and I'm going to show you how I'm going to arrange things. Now the primary things that I am concerned about storing here are my planes. I currently have zero storage for these. So everything else I'll kind of build up over time. The way I'm going to do this is by spacing them about a half of an inch apart and I'm going to use these Baltic birch strips that I cut to do that. It'll also help keep them from moving back and forth if I put these in as guides. So I'll start with my longest one here, right up against the edge, then I bring in the number seven. Then I go to the next longest one. Okay, there's the number five. And the next one down, just butt it up right against each other. There's a smoother. Now this guy, I actually want to rest on the back end of the case like this. So I can't put one of these sticks all the way in because it's going to wind up hitting this guy. But all I really need is a guide inserted somewhere there. So I could just install that one somewhere around that location. Now this is great if the case was to stay on its back, right? Uh, obviously if this is standing up straight, we need something more substantial to hold these guys in place. So that's what these little clips are. Essentially, it's just rabbited on the back, a little bit of a circle, so that as I rotate them back and forth, um, the corners won't hit. It's spaced, each one is basically rabbited just the right amount so it fits over the appropriate plane, and they're all pretty close to begin with. And what I have here is a little pan head pocket screw, and the reason I chose this is because the screw hole here is pretty well oversized. This is not what I would normally do because I really don't want it to grip too much on this. I want it to grip really well into the back panel so that once this goes through, you know, if it gets stripped, I should still, you know, the whole point is to be able to turn it but not loosen the screw. That's kind of what I'm going for. And a, a pan head screw is nice. It doesn't have a, a big taper at the bottom to contend with. So these guys will sit like so and hold them in place. And so when you need to get a particular plane out, you just rotate the little clip out of the way and then you can pull the plane out of its position. So that's what I'm going to do so far. I have one idea that involves magnets. I'm not 100% sure that I'm going to use it, but it's a maybe at this point. So if I do, I'll definitely show it to you. Now for these little doohickeys, it's very simple. All I do is make sure that the screw tip is protruding just by a little bit, place it about where I think it should be, and then use that tip to pivot around. And I'm just confirming that I have free rotation and that I can move that thing out of the way when I need to. Once I'm there, I give it a little tap with my hammer and that makes sure it's not gonna slip out of the way on me. And now just drive it home. Now I did decide to try putting in some rare earth magnets just to see how it works out. So it's not really going to hurt anything, it can only help. So I'm just putting in a half inch hole with a Forstner. And it should just go in like that. And a little epoxy should do the trick. Let's hope. I highly recommend, right before installing it, confirm which side you need up. Okay, clearly, I don't want that there. Clearly, this side goes down. And to keep it from spreading too much and getting on your finger, push it down with a paper towel. When the squeeze out comes up, it goes right into the, uh, the material. 
So now we're gonna install the doors. And this is gonna be the easiest hinge installation you'll ever do. The hinges that we're gonna use are called piano hinges. And if you're not familiar, this is what a piano hinge looks like. It's just a very long butt hinge for the most part. Now the cool thing about a piano hinge is that it can support a lot of weight because you have so many points of attachment as you go across the length of the hinge. So you can use it for very heavy things. This is gonna be perfect for the doors, especially if you have a little bit of extra weight and other tools being hung on those doors. Now the application of the hinge, you can get tricky. We can try to, to, to mortise maybe. I don't know why you would necessarily wanna do that, but I find the easiest uh, installation is right on the outside of the case. Now some people may not find that attractive. Here's the problem. I really don't want these screws going into the end of the plywood. That's not nearly as strong as when screws go into the face of plywood. So for me, I don't think it really looks that bad. It's just the side, um, you know, it's a piano hinge. What are you gonna do? So to install these, this is so simple, it's ridiculous. All I'm gonna do is, well, let me get the right bit in here first. All I'm gonna do is line it up by eye. Well, first of all, you want your door lined up, right? And that is also eyeballed. There's a nice even gap on the top and bottom. And if you're flush on this edge, you're ready to install that hinge. So all I'm gonna do is center the hinge by eye, and make sure the barrel is pretty much right on the, the gap there, and drive in a screw. Now, an important thing to notice here, a lot of times these hinges come with really nice brass screws and those are incredibly easy to strip out. So I highly recommend you use the cheaper, small steel screws, um, put your initial holes in with that, and then go back and install your brass screws. Now, especially if you're doing this in a, you know, this plywood's not that hard, so it's not that big of a deal, but if you're using a really dense hardwood, you're gonna strip out those brass screws before you know it. So always make your hole first with your steel screws. They're not gonna strip, and then go back for your brass screws. So I have one on one side, and I will come over and secure the other side with another screw. Double check my gap, that looks good. And another one here at the top. Okay. And I've got plenty of these brass screws, so I'm gonna try them out. Now that everything is relatively secure, I'm just gonna drive one and see how well it goes. That's no problem. This plywood's definitely softer than hardwood. Let's just give it a, a test run here. That's nice. See, and here's the other great thing opens all the way. Now, one thing I forgot to mention is these hinges typically come much longer than you need. I and mean, the chances of finding one that's exactly the size that you need is pretty slim. So you're gonna have to cut them down. Just cut it very carefully, put it into a vise, and if you can, try to cut right in the seam between the barrels, and it'll make your life a whole lot easier. So here it is, our finished tool chest. Now, the first thing you'll notice is the doors, they're still open. What I need to do is add a little magnetic catch. I don't happen to have one, but it's a very inexpensive piece of hardware that just screws into the top and a little metal plate goes on the inside here and we'll catch it and make sure that the doors stay closed. Another thing I wanna show you here are the handles. Since this is gonna be mounted on the wall, chances are it's gonna be quite a bit higher than where it's sitting right now. So the easiest way for me to open those doors is a handle that actually scoops up a little bit. And these are perfect because my fingers can go right into that little cove there. Now to make these, I started with a double stacked thing of plywood, basically the same thing like we made the top and bottom from. And then I just cut it to about an inch and a quarter in width. And I basically cut a strip that was long enough to, to make two handles. So that way I don't have to work with really, really tiny pieces. But I used a, a big honking cove bit to create the inner cove. And then I used a big giant round over bit to make the rounded over edge. And the rest was just down to hand sanding. So a nice comfortable handle, pretty nice to look at. Now, let's open it up. I even have a squeak in it already. That's awesome. On the inside, 
you can see the arrangement is pretty similar to what I used to have in my old tool chest, except for this one's much more organized and much more secure. First of all, this was the big concern, was how to get all these tools in here looking good and nice and secure and safe. So just to review, of course, the planes. Now those magnets worked out great. Check this out. Now it's not, you know, I wouldn't trust the magnet alone, but it certainly helps things. As you place the plane in there, the magnet grabs it and it gives a pretty decent amount of resistance. It's the same thing for the number seven. So just by itself, with nothing holding it in place, it's up there. And then when you add the clip, now you're talking about something that's secure and not going anywhere. And the guides, of course, on the sides keep everything from moving around. Up top here, I've got basically just two dowels into the back panel. And that was why we wanted that back panel to be three quarters of an inch thick, because we want to put dowels into it. And I've got my spoke shaves up there. Two dowels hold my little shoulder plane in place. On the left side, of course, we've got the adjustable shelves, block planes, various different planes that are a lot harder to hang. Uh, my router plane, I've got some bits down here, some bits up top. Basically, sky's the limit, you know, it's just whatever you want to use that space for. Now, like I said, the inside of my doors, the reason I went with doors was because I thought it would be more useful to most people. I don't know what I'm going to put there yet. I don't really have a need for it, but the great thing is you always need more storage eventually. So that's a future storage option. On this side, I decided that I would put a few of these little metal clips. Now, I bought a, a couple different types. There's ones with a little metal arm here, and this one is just the spring loaded that you, you lift up and oops, that's what I installed here. And I thought what a great idea to be able to store my papers and things that I, as I'm working on a project. This project is a perfect example of one where I've got a stack of papers and SketchUp drawings and they just kind of get scattered all over the place. And this is a nice way to store them for later use. And you can even put something like maybe a little pencil trough down at the bottom or something so you could put some pencils in there. And you may consider putting these on the outside. Now, for now, I want to just look at wood. I don't really want to put papers on the outside, but these things are so easy to install. Why the heck not? At some point, you may really uh, enjoy having access to them there. So that's it for the most part as far as the interior storage. The only thing left to show you is the French cleat in the back. Now, the French cleat storage system is one of the simplest but one of the most heavy duty ways to hang something. And this cabinet, this cabinet is heavy, especially when it's loaded down with tools. So you need something that is secured to the studs and you want to be absolutely sure that the entire piece is supported. So it's really easy to make. All you need to do is take a two to three inch strip of your plywood and put a 45 degree bevel on it. And just make sure you have two pieces because one piece is going to be installed and of course I would want the actual piece, this is just a sample. My actual piece is going to go full length from one side to the other. And it gets glued, you might even screw it in place, whatever you want to do, but I would definitely use some sort of attachment to the back panel because I don't want all of the weight to be pushed onto this uh, top that puts a lot of weight or a lot of uh, stress on these joints here. So if I glue the entire cleat to the back panel as well, that helps to distribute that pressure a little bit. So once it's all the way across, make sure that the angle is going upward here. This guy gets secured to the wall. And the great thing is this is plenty long. You should easily be able to hit two to three studs with this. This guy gets screwed to the wall and hanging it is so easy. All you need to do is lift it in place and drop it onto the cleat like that. And it will be completely secure. It is not going anywhere once you do that. So that's the French cleat system. Well, I don't know about you guys, but this project really excites me. And the tool chest is great, but it's not so much the project itself that excites me, it's the level of communication that we had going into this. You guys picked the project, you guys gave me information and advice on the joinery, on the doors, thank you, Boas. And, uh, you know, it was a constant back and forth as I went through this process. And now finally, the final product is here, and you guys can take that information and use it to make your own stuff. Um, to me, that is why I created the Guild, is to create this sort of community where we can all learn from each other, teach each other, and just share this information back and forth, making us all better woodworkers. So hopefully in the future, as we get into more uh, projects that aren't necessarily just shop furniture, we're talking real deal projects, it's just going to get better and better. So uh, thank you guys for being along for the ride, and please let me know. If you decide to build something like this, I want to see it, because 
Uh, I had an absolute blast building this project and I know you guys will too. So thanks for watching.